When working with groups of objects in JavaScript, you will likely run across loops. Loops in JavaScript let us iterate over and perform actions on a collection of items like arrays or objects. The most common loop is the for loop, which has four parts. The for loop has the initial expression, the conditional expression, the increment expression, and the loop body. Here is a for loop in action. We have the initial expression, which is saying that the loop should start at 1. Then we have our conditional statement, which is saying run as long as count is less than 6. And finally, we have our increment expression, which in this case is adding 1 to count at the end of each iteration. Each time the loop runs through the body, it's called an iteration. When this code runs, we will see it loop through five times. Notice how it starts at one, and then at the end of each iteration, it adds on one to get the next value of count. There are a few other things about the for loop that we should know, because it may affect how you see them written in other places. First, you will most likely see the variable name i written instead of count. The i stands for iterator. Again, iteration is one loop through a loop. Often, the counter will start at zero as well. However, this can be customized if need be. Next, I want to point out that it's possible to have multiple initial expressions. Here, we are assigning a count of i equal to zero as well as a max equal to the number of items in our post IDs array. This is actually a preferable option as opposed to the way it's done down here. Notice that we're doing the same thing except that post IDs.length is calculated every single time the loop runs. The thing about the initial expression is that this code at the beginning here, or this i and max, only runs once when the loop is set up. However, the rest of the code, the conditional statement and the increment statement, these are going to run every single time. So for this reason, it's preferable to store or set these variables up front here, where they will only be set and calculated once. We can also have multiple conditional statements like we see in this example. Here, we have post IDs from two separate WordPress sites. Then, we are setting a different max for each one and saying continue to loop as long as i is less than the length of both of these. Since one of these is less than the other one, when we run this, it will only run through three times. However, if we were to change this to an OR statement, we would see that it runs all the way to the end for one of them, although it's returning undefined for the other. While this is kind of an example of multiple conditional statements, it's more an example of these operators in action than it is an example of multiple statements like we had before with the initial expression. However, it is important to know that you can run multiple or complicated conditional tests within a loop like this. You've probably also noticed that it is possible to break these down into multiple lines when they're separated by a comma or by semicolons and our code will still work. This can make it a little bit easier than trying to write everything on one line. In this example, you'll see that we have written out everything in one line and as you won't be surprised to find out, we could also have multiple increment statements at the end of a for loop. In this case, not only are we adding to our iterator, but we're also reducing from stock each time. However, when we run this, you'll notice that it doesn't work exactly as expected because the stock is not taken off until the very end of the loop. To make this a little bit better, we could potentially take off the stock at the very beginning, before the loop runs. Oh, sorry, that can't go at the end there. Or we could add this within, and we could see the stock is removed before the order is placed. However we do it, this example is just to point out, like the others, that we could have multiple expressions for both our initial 
conditional, and increment statements. One thing that may be surprising, though, is that all of these expressions are also optional. For example, we could define the variable before the loop starts, place our conditional statement within the loop, and then add our incrementer at the end of the loop before it closes. Although the expressions are all empty for the for loop, we still had to write all of the different pieces ourselves. And this is the benefit of the for loop. All of the information that we need to control the loop can be placed right inside on the same line where we write the loop. This can be more convenient than having things spread out like we see them here. We also see down here when we go to run our code a warning telling us that we may be exposing a potential infinite loop. The infinite loop is an important thing to understand when it comes to loops, so let's close out with that now. An infinite loop is a loop in which the conditions to end the loop are never met and the loop runs indefinitely. This is not a good thing and will likely result in an error, the browser crashing, or something similar. This is an example of an infinite loop. Can you tell at a glance what's wrong with it that would cause it to loop through indefinitely? The reason is, is that at the end, instead of incrementing on i, we are incrementing on max. So every time this loop runs, i stays as zero and max gets bigger. If we try to run this in the browser, it will ultimately crash our program and potentially the entire browser itself. The reason we will use an error handling tool like JSLint throughout this course is that it will help expose potential problems like this before we try to run the code in the browser. We'll talk more on testing tools later, but for now, let's take a look at some of the other types of loops available in JavaScript.